This is Joshua Levine. Welcome back to the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. In this episode, Dr. Brogan discusses with Dr. Kerchesky her recent article in Neurocritical Care in which clovetapine was compared to nicardipine for blood pressure control in the neuro ICU. Hi, this is Mike Brogan. I'm a neurointensivist at Regions Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Lisa Kerchesky from Virginia Commonwealth University. We're going to discuss her recent paper published in Neurocritical Care titled Clavidipine versus Nicardipine for Acute Blood Pressure Reduction in a Neuroscience Intensive Care Population. Dr. Kerchesky, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me today. Before we get started, I should remind our listeners that our current podcast release is intended to accompany the Neurocritical Care Society Twitter Journal Club March 13th and 14th. Listeners can join the online discussion via Twitter by using the hashtag NCSTJC. So Dr. Kraszewski, some of our listeners will be trainees or new neuroscience nurses. Can you give us a little background on the importance of blood pressure control in acute neurologic injury? Yeah, absolutely. So we do know that there are some specific blood pressure goal recommendations for our neurocritical care patients depending on their type of injury. So that might include lowering their blood pressure so that we can administer TPA safely, or it might be having a tightly controlled blood pressure to prevent reperfusion injury or to prevent hematoma expansion in some of our patients who suffer head bleeds. But regardless of this goal, blood pressure, and it may range depending on their actual diagnosis, we do know that we want these patients at goal blood pressure as soon as possible. So as you mentioned in your paper, nicardipine is typically the first choice for neurointensive care patients requiring continuous antihypertensive infusions. From a pharmacy standpoint, how is clavidipine different from nicardipine, and what might the potential advantages and disadvantages be? That is correct. So the use of nicardipine is specifically uh, addressed in certain guidelines, especially the older version of the ischemic stroke guidelines, in which that it has been the agent of choice for intravenous medications in terms of blood pressure management. Now, with that said, the new stroke guidelines that were released last month now specifically mention that nicardipine or clavidipine could be used, but at the time of our study, um, nicardipine was often referred to as the agent of choice for continuous IV antihypertensive. Clavidipine, like nicardipine, is an intravenous dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, Where these two medications are going to differ is that clavidipine has a more potent arterial vasodilating activity. Now, unlike nicardipine, clavidipine is manufactured in an IV lipid emulsion, which allows for this medication to have a much quicker onset as well as a shorter half-life and a shorter terminal half-life compared to nicardipine. So clavidipine's half-life is just one minute with a terminal half-life of 15 minutes compared to nicardipine, which actually demonstrates a triphasic half-life. So that means the longer that the drug's on board, the more it converts over into these different phases of half-life and more drug accumulation occurs. So in the early distribution phase, the alpha half-life of nicardipine is only two and a half minutes. Then as the drug's used for longer, the intermediate phase or the beta half-life is about 45 minutes. And finally, um, after several hours of use, the slow terminal phase or gamma half-life is about 14 and a half hours. So you can see that the benefit of clavidipine here would be a much more predictable blood pressure control. And additionally, we won't see any drug accumulation with clavidipine no matter how long the drug's on board. The drug's metabolized via plasma esterases, so there's no accumulation or considerations for hepatic or renal insufficiencies in patients. Now, nicardipine not only does it have the triphasic half-life, but it also um, is extensively hepatically metabolized, and it does have CYP2D6 and CYP3A4 involvement, so that there is significant potential for drug interactions with that medication. In addition to the benefits of the more predictable pharmacokinetic profile is a significant decreased volume of administration that we do see with clavidipine. So this could be beneficial um, in patients who are sensitive to fluid overload. Now, a downside of clavidipine use would be its compatibility with other IV medications. Um, The fact that it's recommended to change the IV tubing as well as the bottles every 12 hours after spiking them to prevent microbial growth. And also, clavidipine is contraindicated in any patients who have any egg or soy product allergies. And then lastly, I did just want to point out that clavidipine is actually manufactured 
um, in ready-to-use IV bottles, and those can be stored um, pretty much anywhere in the hospital, whereas nicardipine does also come in pre-mixed bags, but some institutions may be compounding their nicardipine. So if they are compounding it in the IV room, that is going to delay a time to initiation of therapy. I appreciate that background. Can you tell us a little bit about the overall study design you guys used? Absolutely. So with our study, what we did was a retrospective review of adult neurocritical care patients that were admitted to our institution over approximately a three-year period. Um, We only included patients who warranted IV medications for blood pressure reduction and that were admitted with a primary neurologic injury for needing the blood pressure reduction. Our objective of this study overall was really to evaluate blood pressure reduction and blood pressure control in these neurocritical care patients who received either um, IV nicardipine as their agent for blood pressure reduction or IV clavitapine. Um, We did enroll our patients in a two-to-one ratio of nicardipine to clavitapine, and we really did that because we knew that we would have significantly more nicardipine patients that would qualify for the study than clavitapine. Nicardipine is the standard of care that we use here at BCU, at least at the time of the study, for acute blood pressure reduction. So we mapped two nicardipine patients to one clavitapine patient based on both their indication for why they warranted blood pressure reduction as well as their stated systolic blood pressure goal. And we tried to limit bias in either group, knowing that the blood pressure goal was going to range anywhere from a goal of less than 140 systolic blood pressure to less than 180 and sometimes even 220, depending on the mechanism of injury. And we wanted to make sure we had an equal distribution of those goals within the two groups. So making sure you weren't accidentally comparing subarachnoid hemorrhage patients with ischemic stroke patients and the like. I think that's important for listeners to know. Obviously, a patient who has a blood pressure goal of less than 220 compared to someone who has a goal of less than 140 is going to achieve their goal blood pressure much quickly with significantly less drug exposure. So we really wanted to try to avoid that type of bias. So how did the two drugs compare in your study? Right. So our primary outcome that we wanted to look at essentially was the time that it took the patients to achieve their goal blood pressure, as well as the amount of time that they spent within goal blood pressure range. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't just counting that first blood pressure value that was at goal and then forgetting about the rest of the time that they were on the infusion. What we found is that there was no statistical significance in regards to the difference of time to target, but we did find the difference in terms of clavitapine patients did achieve their goal blood pressure within 30 minutes compared to nicardipine patients that achieved their goal within 46 minutes. How does your study compare to other studies regarding clavitapine time to blood pressure goal? So the majority of the studies that are published which compare clavitapine to other intravenous antihypertensive medications are actually not in neurocritically ill patients which is a major reason why we wanted to look at our patient population. So the one major study that we drew comparisons to was the Accelerate trial. And essentially with that study, they were able to look at about 35 patients and found that in using clavitapine, their patients achieved their goal target blood pressure within a median of five minutes. And then overall, everyone was at goal within 30 minutes. So we're similar in that our average time to goal was 30 minutes as well. Unfortunately, the biggest limitation of our retrospective study was the fact that uh, our hospital policy for charting blood pressures is really just hourly measurements. Now, with that said, if we do have a patient who, say, has an arterial line and is getting continuous blood pressure readings or the bedside nurse is taking more frequent blood pressures, she is able to chart as many as, as she would like to chart or can chart, but is only technically required to chart hourly blood pressure. So we were limited in the fact that our patients could have actually been achieving goal blood pressure sooner, but we are very limited to our charting and our record keeping. Moving on to the time spent in target, there was a similar percentage of time spent within target range in in both groups. So we do think that our study is small and likely underpowered, but that because every minute is really important in a neurological injury patient, that we do think that there is some significance in seeing that clavitapine patients did achieve their first measured target goal blood pressure 16 minutes sooner than our nicardipine patients. 
And then um, comparing our secondary outcomes, we did look at a number of secondary outcomes. So we did want to characterize the average and maximum medication doses for each group plus the overall infusion length of time, of which we found longer infusion times in the clavidipine group. But with that said, the clavidipine group still had a smaller volume of infusion, which there is, again, some significance in that. And then lastly, we did look at a few safety endpoints in terms of hypotension as well as tachycardia. And hypotension we define as the cell blood pressure is less than 100 millimeters of mercury and tachycardia is a heart rate greater than 120 beats per minute and found similar events of the hypotension and tachycardia in both groups. So we didn't attribute an appreciable safety difference between either drug. You mentioned a moment ago that the median infusion length for the clavidipine group was longer than the nicardipine group. What do you think might account for that? Right. That's a good question. So the median infusion length in our clavidipine group was 23 hours versus 13.5 hours with the nicardipine group. So we do have a couple theories as to why the infusion time was longer. We didn't actually look at when oral maintenance antihypertensive medications were initiated. So it could be that we were not starting those maintenance medications in a timely fashion. And coupling that with clavidipine's very short half-life, you'll very quickly see the patient's blood pressure when they're off of the clavidipine medication. So if we are not starting those oral antihypertensives and we're shutting the clavidipine off, those patients are going to return back to what their true baseline blood pressure is. When you flip it over to the nicardipine side, and now these patients with an average of 13 and a half hours, they're flipping over to their gamma half-life, which lasts 14 and a half hours. So these patients probably still had the nicardipine on board, essentially. So even if they also weren't started on their oral maintenance regimens, despite the nicardipine not infusing, it was likely that there was still drug on board, which we don't think was happening in the clavidipine group. Now, there's one thing that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds. Almost none of the hospitals I've worked at have started embracing clavidipine yet. And the common question that I'm going to get from folks in my hospital if I start asking about this is, well, how does the cost compare between nicardipine? That's a great question. Now, I can only really speak to the AWP pricing because that is the published pricing. And most institutions have different contracts. Um, with their suppliers that might make one medication cheaper than the other. But I can speak more specifically to our institution. What we do at our institution is we only use the premix bags, which is just a concentration of 0.01 milligrams per ml. Now, clavidipine is a little less convoluted in that clavidipine is only available as a premix infusion bottle of 50 cc's. One size, um, you can't compound it yourself in your IV room because of the lipid emulsions. The comparison that we published in our paper compared the premixed bag of nicardipine at the 0.1 milligram per ml concentration with the premixed bottle of clavidipine. And what we decided to take into account is to use the study data. So we took our median dose for each drug as well as the median infusion time. So taking into account the longer duration of infusion for clavidipine and found essentially that the prices were very similar. I'm a little bit cheaper in the clavidipine group for our specific institution. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to go through your study with us. Is there anything else you would like to add or any question that you wish I had asked? I don't have any other questions. Do most people have a question they wish you asked? Not usually. (laughs) Once again, I want to thank you for joining us to talk about this, and we look forward to the Twitter Journal Club. Once again, that is hashtag NCSTJC. Thank you very much. This podcast is produced by the Neurocritical Care Society, whose mission is to promote quality patient care, professional collaboration, research, training, education, and advocacy in neurocritical care. The Neurocritical Care Society provides and advocates for the highest quality of care for patients with critical neurological illness throughout the world. Follow us on Twitter, at Neurocritical, on Facebook, or visit www.neurocriticalcare.org for more information about NCS and the comprehensive resources that it offers. On behalf of the Neurocritical Care Society, thanks for listening.